Uh, well, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about how, as a non-designer, I earned designers' trust and built and led a large design team. So um, before I stepped foot in an office that looked anything like this, uh, the only offices I knew were sort of glass towers on Park Avenue in a management consulting firm and sort of a glass building in Boston, a private equity firm. The closest thing I had done to design was laying out the school newspaper while I was in college. Um, and so I first stepped foot into sort of this building uh, on a sketchy street in San Francisco. Um, and I was a business school student at Stanford. I was expecting to spend 10 weeks in this building uh, and then go back to business school. Ended up spending five and a half years at a company called Thumbtack. They took a bet on me as someone who had never built product before. I took a bet on them as an eight person unfunded company and ended up spending five and a half years there. Um, so just for those of you who don't know, Thumbtack is a way to find and hire local professionals. Um, so, you know, uh, I want to go back. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if I have the latest one, but I'll, I'll make it through. Um, so, so basically, you know, five, a year into this company, it wasn't going very well. I had hired a couple designers. They didn't trust me. They were uttering like sentences like this. Jake doesn't value design. This is not a, this is not a design driven company. We aren't empowered to do good design work. So things were not going well, right? They wanted me out of the building. They didn't want to be their manager. So you know, five and a half years or four and a half years later, things were a lot different. So what did I do to change that? Like, what did I learn as a non-designer to do to sort of earn designers' trust? The first was like, just geek out on design. And so whether you're obsessed with, you know, a color-coded bookshelf, I actually don't have one of these, but I think they're kind of amazing. Or you're obsessed with the ceiling of your favorite art museum in New York. This is the Whitney. I'm obsessed with the ceiling, both the sort of geometry of it and the function of how all of the exhibits sort of hang off the ceiling of it. Or it's just like a, a product, right? I think it's amazing what Instagram's built in the stories editor is this amazingly simple but incredibly functional piece of product design. Um, and sort of through all these, and so uh, is that these um, trust is really built by connecting with people over things that they also care about. And so as, as me as a nine designer, just asking designers questions and learning more and sort of learning to just trusting them, like so they trusted me, really, really helped in. Uh, so I found this, this quote that was sort of really, really powerful, is at its heart, we're, um, we're still quite, tri quite tribal, which is why people tend to more easily trust people who are more similar to themselves, right? That's really what, by geeking out of desi on design, really what I was doing was sort of connecting with designers kind of where they are. And I learned to do this kind of as early as starting from interviewing designers. And so basically in the third minute of, minute of a conversation with designers that I was potentially going to hire, I would just find something, or I, I may do this today, I found something in their, in their work, in their portfolio to just comment on and say I loved and geek out on with them for a couple minutes as part of that interview. And I felt like their body language would like almost always change in that. And they'd be like, oh, I trust this person. He cares about what, um, he cares about what I do and my craft and my trade. Uh, second is be the voice of the customer. So as a, as a product person, or really as anyone in a consumer tech environment, you really need to be close to the voice and sort of be the voice of the customer. And I've learned that when I give feedback in coming from the voice of that customer, it totally changes the way a designer thinks about that feedback and accepts that feedback. And in terms of sort of really driving that voice of the customer, there's kind of two mechanisms I've really learned to use. The first is storytelling. So, you know, saying, you know, last week when I was on the phone with a photographer in Minnesota and she told me this and this and this and that about her business, that's really powerful. And people kind of remember those stories and those anecdotes. Obviously, you don't want those anecdotes to be random and not indicative of your customers, but, but they're very, very powerful when they are indicative of your customers and you keep coming back to them. The second is synthesis, right? And I think that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of this is, confusion around what matters like creates disagreements and the synthesis around like what the customer cares about and bringing that into the design team is something a product person can really do to create that trust and so whether that be customer journey mapping which is what you see here personas even just stating like what are the top things our customers actually care about by bringing that into the into the conversation that engenders a bunch of trust and so when i give feedback to a designer I almost always couch it with 
a statement around, remember when we were talking to this person or remember, come back to the journey or where this person is in the journey. And I find that in that case, it's a lot less of this is what Jake thinks versus what Adrian, the designer, thinks. Instead, it's like, this is what our customers care about. And I'm giving you this, we're talking about this feedback grounded in a sense of facts, not grounded in more of opinion. Um, the third is like paint a compelling vision. Um, as a product person leading an organization or as a CEO leading an organization, especially young startups really thrive on compelling visions. And I found that like the designers that have worked for me more than almost anyone else really, really, really need this to thrive. I was alluding this before, but I found a lot that confusion over what matters and kind of where we're going in the strategy often is the thing that creates a lot of conflict. And if the company is aligned on the vision and the strategy of how to get there, um, it, it really changes, changes lots of things. And I found as Thumbtack was scaling from eight of us to sort of 500 over several years that I was surprised as a leader how much I had to focus on reiterating and restating this vision to keep everyone sort of on the same page and aligned to avoid this confusion, creating disagreement, which had the potential to then erode a bunch of trust. And what I would say is like a company vision isn't sort of enough. What you've got to also do, basically the, basically the, point, the point is that you want each specific product team or each specific team at a company to have a real vision and have an understanding of what are they trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis and how does that then ladder up to sort of the broader company vision. The fourth is defer on the visuals, is I want to respect and learn to respect that I am not a designer. I didn't go to design school. I do not have any sort of background in color theory, any background in typography. And when it comes to those decisions, I may have an opinion. I may not think this is totally the right typeface. I may not think this is the totally right color or way to use color in this, but I've learned that that's probably not the battle that I'm sort of should fight. And I should respect and learn to respect and show respect for a designer's trade, sort of craft and trade on that. And then sort of like leave that and be sensitive to that and sort of debate and fight sort of different battles. And that, that really not getting in the weeds on those things sort of really helps. It's also true as a product person, not trying to get in the weeds on engineering decisions for in a very, very similar way. Um, the fifth is actually go solve hard design problems. So as a product person, that doesn't mean you are not good at being a designer. And I actually felt like I built a tremendous amount of designer trust over the years by basically helping designers when they are stuck. And what that means is what I learned not to do is I don't want to impart a solution on them before they have a chance to try. But the moments that sort of ended up creating a bunch of trust was when a designer would come to me and say, Jake, I'm really, really stuck. Can I have an hour of your time to sort of sit here and whiteboard or, or whatever and try to solve that problem? And those moments of when, as a, as a thoughtful product person who has a good UX sense, has a good sense of the customer, digging in and just sort of solving those problems with designers, those moments created a ton of trust. And I think by the end of five and a half years, I think the design team saw me as a designer, even though I had no background in that because I was helpful in actually going and solving those problems with them. Um, so a little bit of a sort of addendum to this is sort of trust is a two-way street, right? And so I just told you five things that I learned to get the trust of designers. But I want to give you a few things at the end of this that sort of as a product person, I suggest to designers of how to actually gain the trust of product people. And this sort of has to go both ways. Though, so this is actually going to you know, mirror Tom's, is sh share, sh share early and share often. Right? The, the, the thing that is most annoying as a product person when working with designers is when you have no clue where a designer is in their process, you feel responsible as a product person for like the delivery of this feature, you're trying to keep these trains on schedule, and the designer is like afraid to share, share their work. And even if like a designer comes to me in two days and says, you know what, Jake, I haven't made that much progress on this. Here's why I think this problem is harder than I thought it was going to be. Let me show you a few things I've done. Maybe we can sort of whiteboard a little bit together. That just like not being a black box, you can't trust a black, black box. So understanding where a designer is, sharing early and often is absolutely huge for sort of earning the trust of a product manager. Um, the second is like let data be your, let yeah, let, let data be your friend. Um, 
Some of my most favorite moments is when a designer comes and basically suggests an analysis that we need to do to better understand how, cust how sort of customers are using our product. And some of these like, great cross-pollination moments I've seen is when a designer and an analytics person are sitting next to each other and they're working together to figure out how are people actually using this product today? What can we learn from the data to inform sort of the next iteration of a design? And I, I think as a product person who's trying to push things forward, analytical and data-driven, having design be data-informed, that doesn't mean it should drive everything. But if, you, if people are using, if millions of people are using a product, I, as a designer, I think I'd want to know how are they using that today? That helps me inform my design decisions. And so having an, a designer who asks for data, it is so comforting and creates so much trust. Um, the last is let good enough be sometimes. I think that it's been very frustrating for me at times working with certain designers who don't sometimes at least make it feel like they understand we're trying to build a company and a business and we have to prioritize and we can't do everything to the nth degree. And so this is actually a framework I stole from Dropbox but was actually very, very helpful for us at Thumbtack and I use this today at Jump Rope in helping us get on the same page about like, what type of design exercise are we doing for each project we take on? Like, is this a quick and dirty, te quick and dirty test where we are just trying to learn something very simple, or maybe not simple, but learn something and ship something quickly that we know is not going to live forever, but it's a sort of very much test and learn, let's get something out, let's be fast, let's be iterative, iterative environment. Versus what is kind of like a standard feature where we're going to use our typical design toolkit, solve the problem, ship it, probably iterate it on a little bit. And what's kind of one of these flagship experiences where we were probably were willing to go beyond the typical kind of design toolkit that we have or, or, or product design toolkit where we have and really create and innovate and push our thinking on design and really not stop solving that problem until we've designed something that is really, really, really exceptional. And I've seen so many situations where a designer and a product manager or a designer and someone else, you know, one person thinks we're in bucket one and the other person thinks we're in bucket three. And of course, they're totally missing each other on timelines, on, you know, level of effort and things like that. And so I've actually found this framework or sort of derivations of it to be incredibly helpful for getting people on the same page, et cetera. Um, so that, that's really all. Um, just tell you a little bit about what I'm building now, which, you know, again, I didn't want to make this talk about that. Uh, I'm building a company called Jump Rope. Um, basically, we're the place to go to discover how to, how to do anything, whether it be a recipe, a craft project, a beauty tutorial, a parenting hack. Uh, we make it super easy for anyone on their iPhone to create a super easy step-by-step -step video. Uh, the vast majority of people are creating these things or doing them from their kitchen counters, their bathroom mirrors, their gyms and garages who have never created video before. And sort of our mission is to go sort of unlock all that knowledge and passion that isn't being shared today by putting an easy tool in people's hands and then having a, you know, an app that lets you discover how to do anything in step-by-step -step guides that you can tap through at your own pace. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for fixing the presentation. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Good point for me just because I'm fascinated yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are just, I'm sure you get that question a lot, what are some of the key differences, why uh, go to Jump Rope versus YouTube and yeah, so, so I think, so again, we're, we're building a two-sided platform, so we have two audiences, right? We have people who have a desire to share their knowledge, show their recipes, show their fitness routines, um, and we have people who want to consume the content. So for people who want to share their knowledge, one is it's just too hard for most people to create a YouTube video. They don't have mastery of Premiere or Final Cut Pro. And also, like, it's hard to know exactly how to structure that content, right? These sort of timeline-based video editors are very open-ended and unstructured, and that's often daunting. And so one is basically we take people who have never created a video before who are intimidated by that software and basically empower them to create a video. The second thing we do is we're very much using the sort of classic two-sided network building path of sort of come for a tool, stay for the network. And I'll give you the analogy there of kind of Instagram. So if you think about Instagram circa 2012, 2013, the way most people were using Instagram is they were using it to filter and edit their photos and show them to Twitter and Facebook. And really the editing tools in Instagram was the draw to turn basically to get people to start using Instagram. And so we're playing a very similar game with, with Jump Rope where basically we're saying come to us as a creator 
And that content's not just going to live in Jump Rope, but we've built technology that lets us programmatically generate a whole bunch of video content for you as the creator. So you get a vertical video, a horizontal video, a square video, a four by five video, an embeddable module for your website or blog, an image file for Pinterest. And so as a creator, basically, if you want to be on multiple platforms, you would otherwise have to create that video multiple times. With Jump Rope, you can create once and we do all that formatting for you. So that's it on the creator side. And then the consumer side, there's really three things that are really frustrating to people about sort of the sort of seven to 10 minute videos you find on YouTube. One is they don't stop and start when you need them to. So if you just want to be entertained, you're often like at the mercy of the slow moving thing that the creator creates. If you're actually cooking and cooking along with it, you actually want to move a lot slower than that content. And so by switching to a much more stories like format, you can tap through at your own pace. Second of all, videos are not interactive, they're not shoppable. And so jump ropes, you know what you need and the creator can put in exactly where to buy them, tap a link and go buy that thing. And third is the big platforms aren't particularly safe places and they're not great place, they're not great at surfacing the right content at the right time. And so we believe we can build a better place and better platform for consuming this content. So if you have an iPhone, check it out on the App Store. Android's coming very soon. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, at, at this point it's, at this point it's launched and it's live. So we're seeing, you know, people every day creating these videos from their kitchen counters, their bathroom mirrors, their gyms and garages. And I think what we've done, I think what's different is I, again, I, I don't know specifically about that platform, so I don't want to comment on any one specifically, but I think that the quality of the or basically the quality of the camera and the processing power of the of what's on your phone are a lot different than they were a couple of years ago right and so you can now with a moderately good iphone create content that looks as good as stuff that is produced in studios and what we've really done is we and we spent basically a year and a half working on this and iterating on it, iterating on it, iterating on it of saying like what really does the creator need to turn this process that otherwise would take hours into you know, 15 to 20 minutes to create a video. And so it's really simplifying that process, that down to sort of its core. And my belief, and this is true of a lot of two-sided platforms, whether it's Thumbtack or Airbnb or Uber, it's really like if you can have this breakthrough in getting the supply, like unlocking this new supply on a platform, that that's really powerful and that's what we're doing, right? We're All of these people have never created a video before all of a sudden can share their knowledge and passion. And so I believe we're, we're in doing that, we'll be able to build the best library of authentic content that anyone has. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I don't I don't think I, I don't feel, I feel like it's a very, very personal decision. I think in terms of why I decided to move on from Thumbtack after five and a half years and go start my own thing, it really, it ended up being a confluence of things. And I don't think any one, it was not any one variable. One is I was living in San Francisco, wanted to be in New York. Two is I've been solving the same problem for five and a half years. And to be honest, like it wasn't, I never had an inherent passion towards local services. I love the concept of building a two-sided platform and marketplace and economy, but I don't know that I was, I was much more inherently passionate about content world than I was about services world. So I sort of had an itch to get back in that direction. And I also felt a little bit that 
you know, I had seen something from eight to 500 people that in terms of being a founder, probably going from sort of 500 to 2000 people and sort of a hundred million in revenue to 500 million in revenue wasn't actually going to make me a better founder. It would have probably made me a better person stepping into a Google or a Facebook, but not as a founder. And so I just felt like the timing was right to go make this jump. But I don't, I wish I had a framework for you. I, I don't really have one. Yep. Sometimes like you this struggle happen and like people will still take their responsible for what they say. Yeah. Uh, so, so one is I will 100% acknowledge there's a lot of overlap. And I think one, one indicative anecdote of that is at Thumbtack, one of the interviews every product manager did in their final round was the same interview every product designer did in their final round, right? Um, I think that there is, I think that, that overlap is okay. And I think that what, this also sort of comes back to trust is I think that if if two people trust each other, actually where the overlap is, is often where the hardest problems are, right? And when I said I would go pair with a designer, it's on those really, really complicated, tricky kind of UX things. And you kind of want two brains working on it. And I think the best companies and the best cultures are ones where there's not these really rigid decision-making frameworks. And I think this is like really one of the things that sets like tech culture apart from traditional culture, a traditional like corporate cultures. And I think you want to build a company where people trust each other, they work together, they solve the hard problems together, as opposed to it needing to be this really, really clear delineation of responsibilities. Because I don't actually believe that creating that really clear delineation of responsibilities is actually feasible, is it, it's not the most productive, and I don't think it builds sort of the right collaborative culture. Jake, cool. thank you so much. Cool.